Thanks, I think. Um, I'm going to talk about image processing and environmental ecological data. And um, cameras are everywhere. And in fact, actually, I have one in my pocket right now. I bet most of you people do as well. Uh, and it's really cheap and easy right now to take pictures and post them on the web or share them. And everybody's doing it. And ecologists are not much different than everyone else. Um, and we're posting lots and lots of pictures, really interesting pictures too, of plants, of blooming events, of animals. Uh, but most of the pictures, though, require still a human being to interpret and to get any sort of quantitative data out of it. And so this is kind of what's been motivating us is to try to use some of the brain power at SENS in order to come up with some image processing scripts in order to get some quantitative information out of images that the ecologists are collecting. I want to talk a little bit about the, the types of images that we collect. Um, we've got targeted images. Uh, ecologist goes out and takes a, a, a specific picture of a plot or of some trees. Or we have uh, cameras that are stationed in the forest and they're repeatedly taking pictures of, of a tree that's going through a blooming event or something. Then there's these multi-purpose, what I'm calling multi-purpose images, which are capturing images, uh, ecological images secondarily. There are roadway conditions or maybe of a, a schoolyard and there happens to be uh, a tree or some grass in the photo. And we can actually take what we're learning from the targeted images and apply that to these kind of secondary images of, of ecological importance. And then there's these user submitted images which we are now just starting to get a whole bunch of and are facing some other interesting te technical challenges of how do we extract information out of <coughs> pictures from cell phones. Okay. Uh, what has kickstarted this whole process of, of at least my interest in taking uh, images of ecological uh, things and trying to come up with scripts is James Reserve, and I think we have been blessed with Michael Hamilton's vision, I don't know how many years ago, where he started outfitting the forest with cameras on posts and cameras on mobile units. Uh, we have been really blessed having the James Reserve on our side. And I have finally become resigned to the fact that no talk I give about imaging will ever not feature the world famous moss cam that is over there in the corner. Uh, Haunted by the moss cam is a little bit too strong, but I'm maybe grateful for its uh, existence. We also have um, a recent establishment in the Costa Rican rainforest of a whole bunch of cameras on towers. This is the MRI project that was uh, funded by the National Science Foundation through a grant that uh, we partly wrote, uh, SENS did. And there's three or four towers up in the rainforest with six cameras <coughs> at different levels. And it's now just coming online. And so right after this talk, I'm gonna go and start playing around with these cameras because I've just finally figured out how to start harvesting these images automatically. It's very exciting. Um, and then uh, there's other classes of targeted images. They're a little less um, Vista-like, but still very important. Uh, every time I give a talk about using cameras as ecological sensors, uh, some ecologist comes up to me afterwards and says, I've got a whole bunch of pictures of my plots. What can I do with them? Because right now we're just scoring them using you know, humans, guessing at how much uh, plant coverage there are in these squares. And so when I get handed these, these sets of images, I said, okay, well, let's, let's see if we can come up with some way to actually extract some data out of this stuff. Multipurpose images, we just uh, have, are tying up a, uh, a project involving thousands of internet connected webcams across the United States. Mostly, they're all freely available. You just have to Google them and you come up with webcam looking at so-and-so schoolyard or this roadway condition. We've been harvesting images, capturing them about twice a day. Uh, and we have one paper published on this, but we're, we're trying to now get our uh, processing a little bit more robust and, and do another crank at it to see if we can include all thousand cameras across the United States looking at, at spring events, how, how the plant phenology, how the blooming and the leafing out events change across the United States and relate that to the remote sensing data that is also freely available. And our What's Invasive uh, Citizen Science campaign has really exploded. And there's lots of people who are uh, clamoring for its use on the Android and now soon, hopefully, the iPhone app when you get huge in. Uh, very shortly, we're going to have an iPhone app. And that's going to 
uh, triple our usage or something. Uh, and they're all submitting user uh, photos of invasive plants. And we're also collaborating with Project Budburst, and they've got their own sets of plants that people are going to start uploading images of. Okay, so most of you people out here, I probably don't have to rally behind Python and R. Mark has actually led us down this path, uh, and we're all falling in line very nicely. He's been championing this, and it's, it's quite, it's actually allowed me to do all sorts of stuff that I've uh, been unable to do by myself. Uh, the nice thing about Python and R, the combination of them both, is that they're not only powerful, but they're also open source and freely available and cross-platform. So anything that I do, that I can make, uh, I can make a script in order to analyze the color sequence of a, of a series of images, I can pass that on to my ecologist friends and they can run it on whatever platform they got going. And so we can now start sharing these kinds of, of tools much more freely than we have been able to in the past. Okay, so what do I do with these tools? What do I do with the Python and the R? Um, one of the easiest things to do is just to look at color, especially if you're looking at plants. And I'm a plant biologist. I haven't been doing too much with animals, but plants are easy often to separate from the background because they're green, or a flower is, is bright red or bright purple or something. So we can look at color and try to use color to then separate out those significant chunks of pictures and, and analyze them, either count pixels or, or count blobs of pixels. And there's lots of ways to play with color. These are a whole bunch of simple color space transformations that we've been playing around with. And I'll, I'll tell you why we've been playing around with these color transformations in a second. But uh, it becomes actually almost, um, it becomes a little bit difficult. There's so many options of playing around with, with image processing, really simple image processing, that you can kind of get lost in all the details. Uh, <laughs> I love this picture. One, of the, one day when somebody actually comes up and asks me what I do. I'm not going to say I'm an ecologist. I'm going to say I work with photographers and, and photography. And then when they ask me to see my work, I'm going to show them something like this. So, isn't this beautiful? This is uh, the result of a, a, a plot where 50% of the ambient rain has been falling on this plot relative to a control. And look at that ground cover. Isn't that wonderful? Except it's actually a really horrible picture because that shadow in the way um, makes it difficult to analyze automatically. A human being can come along and probably lay down a grid and quantify what is the cover of that soil compared to plant. And you know, it's like 30% coverage or something like that. But when you start trying to do this automatically and try to get a, a quantitative, repeatable measurement out of that, ambient conditions like shadows or brightness uh, really start messing you up. And so this is why we've been looking at different color spaces to see if we can come up with a way to eliminate shadows from our analysis. Here's only let's see, five different color spaces, although each one of these three, each one of these five color spaces have three different color components to them. Uh, the top one is just the, your standard red, green, blue color space that is native to most capture you know, cameras. Uh, but then there's different color spaces, and you can see some of them are good at removing the shadow, some of them are better that, than that than others. And for this instance, actually two of them, the YXY and the HSL color spaces um, tend to remove those shadows. And now we can start counting pixels that are above a certain threshold, a little bit lighter or darker than the background, and then get a quantitative number out of that picture regardless of the ambient conditions. Kind of nice. Um, we can also take time-lapse photos. And this is something that ecologists have been doing for a long time, is taking repeated photography of events. And this was from a camera at the James Reserve. Uh, this is about every three days, because uh, PowerPoint really protested when I tried to get all 360 images on there. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, but that just went through an entire year from spring to fall. Uh, and this repeated photography is, is fantastic. We can start looking at events. Uh, but I'm not going to play that again, but it's kind of hard um, visually to see what the heck's going on. So we're also playing around with this, turning these sequences of images using different color spaces in order to try to capture phenological events like spring or fall. So on the left, we've got our spring or, or green leaf detecting color space. And on the right, we're going to see if we can detect fall through the same sequence, sequence of images. And there you go. Fall was very fast. All right, so we're only looking at the red channel or some sort of com uh, a component of the red channel in order to really just grab what that that phenological event is out of that entire sequence of images. And of course, we turn that into 
a graph. So I really wanted to show you those sequence of images because that's a little bit more interesting than looking at graphs, but we always come back to these graphs. And so we've got a couple different color spaces up here, and some of them are good at just detecting green leaves, and some of them are actually pretty good at detecting other things like the fall event. Sweet. Okay. Um, there's also multi-purpose cameras that we've been manually segmenting images and, and looking at tracing sections of those images through time, not just the entire image like we did previously, but also just pieces of it, so we know that there are some um, uh, deciduous components, there are some evergreen components, and we can, we can make graphs through time of those components as well. And that's, that's something that we're, we're continuing, and that's something we can, if you want to talk about this, we also have a paper to show you. Um, the newest thing that we've got going is user-submitted photos of plants, and this has been really, this has really been fantastic. Uh, people out taking geotagged images of invasive weeds for our What's Invasive campaign, and now pretty soon uh, geotagged images of the plants that they're following on a daily basis to tell us when they leaf out, when they flower. Uh, this was a classroom set of data that Phil Rundle led down the Topanga Canyon uh, watershed, and we're collecting really great uh, information on um, locations of weeds. However, once you put a camera in somebody's hands, they'll take pictures of anything, right? So I went to the Catalina Island um, uh, observation page, and a whole bunch of pictures of some meeting in China has been uploaded as, as weed observations. So uh, this is now motivating an entirely new set of investigations, and we have some really smart people working on how do you, how do you distinguish um, someone from a plant. <laughs> and it's not as easy as you might think, and so uh, uh, we have some interns working on it, and that's why this transitions nicely into this, this slide of people who are working very hard on making all this image processing a lot more robust and a lot more, um, a lot better for the ecologists to actually get the data that they want out. Thank you very much. Uh, what kind of expense is involved in setting up a camera system, an automated camera system, and a, transmitting, a, a transmission system so that you can get this data? So the cameras at the, at, uh, in Costa Rica we are using are about a little bit less than $2,000 each. They're really nice cameras. They're pan tilt zoom cameras, and they're internet connected and controlled. So we just have to send them a command, and they move, they zoom in, they take a picture, and they're done. We can also control things like aperture and shutter speed, so start playing around with high dynamic range imaging and stuff like that. Uh, but they're only 640 by 480 pixels as well, too, so there's some limitation. Uh, so that's kind of high-end uh, uh, security <coughs> camera. There's also a, I think it's like a three or $400 unit where you can put your own megapixel camera on the device and it'll take, a, it's called a gigapan, and it will take repeated pictures and pan tilt zoom your own camera and get a, a much higher resolution uh, picture with just a consumer grade camera. Um, the data connections are harder. Uh, the, the cameras at the James Reserve and at La Selva are all hardwired and that's really, really nice. If you actually have to start transmitting images across uh, wireless connections, then it becomes a lot harder. There's a lot of data to transmit and that takes a lot of power. Um, and that's wireless sensor network stuff. Well, you need, uh, so it depends what infrastructure you're tapping into, right? So if the thing is powered, it, that's much easier. Or otherwise, you have to put up a solar installation, right? So why, I mean, doing it over a while, it depends on the frequency of the images, but if you have a local Wi-Fi infrastructure there, then you're fine. If you're in some isolated location and you're relying on the cellular network, then you uh, still want power, either through solar or wired, and you need to get your volume down and then it depends where you are. And if you don't have cellular, then you can talk to Paul Davis about how he sets up his seismic arrays in places, or, or Richard Guy about how they set up their wireless infrastructure in places where there's nothing. Although one, one nice thing about plants is that you pretty much just have to take one picture a day of any pan tilt too. Not much else is going to change. So the frequency, at least for plant observations, is pretty low. Um, 
Aaron, putting your uh, biologist hat back on instead of the photography hat, um, if you could perfect the image recognition <coughs> technology, what's the most interesting new science question you could ask? Going back to the James Reserve, which is really nice, we've got a whole bunch of micrometeorological sensors located in the same places as those cameras. Um, one, one problem, and actually, um, that you will enjoy is the fact that we have way too many pictures, right? We have way too much data, and you've been, you've been saying this for a long time. It's like we're, we're now faced with, with too much information. If we can start automating this kind of um, image analysis and, uh, and extract just numbers out of these pictures reliably, uh, then correlating that with the ambient conditions and seeing how local micrometeorological conditions affect the plant responses, then we can start getting a handle on how those plants may or may not be good indicators of something more general like a global climate change question. Um, and relating that to then other interesting ecological questions like then if the bees are keying in on a temperature signal to emerge or not emerge, what happens to pollination? Uh, when the synchronization of the photo period is off from the temperature period, things like that. It's going to be really fun once we can start correlating these the data that we're capturing with the cameras, with the meteorological stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite understanding why cameras that are on full time as opposed to taking random photos whenever that you may or may not be able to control. Uh, if you just have, especially since you're hardwired, if you are just downstreaming that and uh, the data uh, and then just going through and editing it from this with the stuff that you need on a regular basis. <coughs> I mean, aren't you, if you're just doing periodic snapshots, aren't you potentially losing the ability to, to see something that might be truly relevant? Yes, and I would, it would be so amazing if we could just stream images, assuming we have power, and just collect um, everything that's interesting. We've already, we've nearly filled up our terabyte drive, or how many terabytes have we filled up? I can't remember, of images with this just um, infrequent data capture. So uh, we're starting we're starting kind of slow. We're taking um, snapshots and trying to analyze them uh, with the oh, eventual hopeful um, goal of just having the cameras on all the time and then alerting us to when something interesting has been um, observed. Maybe we're just getting a stream of numbers out of this and then there's an occasional capture of an image as a verification uh, that, that something actually interesting has happened. But that's, um, yes, that would be wonderful. <laughs> So in your earlier slides, you're converting uh, RGB to HSL to kind of pick out what's green and what a plant is. But uh, a lot of plants are green, so is there any further image processing that helps you classify it better? Like what kind of plant? Yes, um, but I really, I'm really bad at it. Um, so uh, the computer science, uh, where, where is Teresa when you need her, right, actually? Um, so I'm doing color because it's really simple and I can do it with Python and R and I can share it with my simple ecologist friends. Um, however, we are also collaborating with the computer science department and the um, uh, computer vision people who are doing all sorts of really fun uh, sift edge detection and all sorts of other cool things and, and um, detecting like a behavior in nest boxes and, and uh, identifying birds based on signatures and, and template matching and things like that. Um, and I'm leaving that up to the really smart people. Are there posters on that? There are posters and also Gorov uh, group also does some work in this and it's a good segue as well. Thank you. Thank you, Eric.